It has been a while since I've been here. It is good to be back. And, uh, and over the summer, I had the chance of going on vacation with my family and also spent some time doing some of the, the ordination work that's required as part of joining the Alliance denomination. So um, for those of you that preached this, this uh, summer and helped with some of those things so I could work on these other things, I want to say thank you to you. And uh, for those of you who pray for me or would like to start, um, there are the, the general things as a family uh, at home and also a family in the church, uh, but also to pray for some of these things that reach beyond my regular schedule would be appreciated as well. And one of the things that I did this summer was I, I did some landscaping in our backyard, and that included uh, cutting down a tree. And um, so when I went to cut down the tree, it wasn't a big tree, and my saw was broken, so I decided to use some of the things that I had around my house to do the job. And keep in mind that I'm a pastor, not a lumberjack. And in the end, I, <laughs> I took the largest screwdriver I had, and I hammered it into the trunk of the tree, and I wiggled it back and forth, and I pulled it out, and I did that again, and again, and again, and again, until I wanted to give up. And when the blisters were starting to form, and the neighbors were out on their decks watching me, <laughs> even the dog was looking at me funny, um, I finally was able to push the tree down and stomp off what was left attached. And so I, I did it. And... And for some reason, Courtney believes that this victory is more embarrassing than it is impressive. So I'm wearing a tie today to make up for that. Uh, but I do agree with her on one thing, and that is that it could have been a whole lot easier, a whole lot faster, a whole lot cleaner if I would have just borrowed a saw from a neighbor. But where would the sermon illustration be in that? So if you search on the internet, and you probably don't have to because you probably have some common sense, to cut down a tree, generally people use a saw or a chainsaw because it's blatantly obvious. That's what they're intended to be used for. And so when I set out to use a hammer and a screwdriver to do the work of a saw, I knew that this may not work. I knew that there, this could go terribly wrong. And even though it did work, I don't ever want to do it again. It, it's not what it was intended for. We have tools all around our houses. We have in the, them in our garages. We have them in our kitchens. We have them in our sheds, all over the place. And everything has a purpose. And it's designed in a way to be used for that purpose. And when we take something and use it in a way it was not intended to be used, things can go wrong. Things can go terribly wrong. And this is the kind of logic I want to use as we talk about the church for the next three weeks here. I want to apply this logic to the church. God has designed it in a way to function a specific way and to accomplish a specific purpose. And what I think the reason why the church has been such the cause of disappointment, the cause of hurt, even the cause of scandal over the years, it's because the church is being used by people to do something that it was never intended to do. And so what I want to do these, these coming weeks is to look again at what the church is, why it exists, what its purpose is, and how it is supposed to function. This is important for us to understand so that we move forward so in a way that we can flourish as God's people and fulfill God's purpose. And the first thing I want to do is, just based on the way that people talk about the church, is I think that it's important that we remind ourselves that the church is not merely a building or a place where Christians gather for worship. If it was, it would seem strange that Ephesians chapter 5 would declare that Christ loved the church building and gave himself up for her. That's not what it says. And it's not wrong to, to refer to this building or any other church as a church, but it may be unhelpful for us in the long run because by doing so, many people have begun to confine the church to only what happens within the church building. But this building on its own is not the church. Throughout history, Christians have gathered in a variety of places, from buildings to homes, from caves to catacombs. And depending on the, the persecution at the time, there are believers out there that would publicly invite their friends, their, their, their neighbors, to a gathering of Christians. But at other times, they use secret symbols to identify where they would be worshiping together so that they wouldn't be discovered. 
And so in a way, there has been a variety of places where people have met. And although in this place, at this time, we have the blessing of being able to have a building and to meet in it publicly, just because we have this building, if it was taken away, if it was ruined or destroyed or seized tomorrow, this church would not cease to exist. So the question is, what is the church? The Greek word itself in the New Testament points us to people. And throughout the, the, the Bible, the, the New Testament specifically, whenever we see the word church, it's referring to an assembly of people, people who are gathered together. And so this is why Paul, in, in the book of Philemon, for example, he, he sends greetings to the church, not the building, but it says to the church, the people in that house. So allow me to be crystal clear. I know for many of us, we, we get this. But we want, we want to be on the same page as we move forward. The Bible doesn't speak of the church as much as a what, as much as it does a who. So now the question needs to be, who is the church? And that same Greek word literally means the called out ones. It means the separated ones. And so when we think about a specific group of people, the way it's being used in the New Testament is referring to to a specific group, specifically the people of God. When Peter confesses to Jesus that, that he believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says to him that based on that belief, that confession, Jesus is going to build his church. And so, if anyone or anyone who, all, who believe and confess the same thing that Peter does and believe about Jesus the same thing then they are a part of the church. That's how this community, this group of gathered people, these called out ones are going to be identified in what they think or believe about Jesus. So we cannot claim then that just by going to church, any church all over the world, just because you've gone to church or you are here today, it doesn't mean that you are part of the church. That's important for us to understand. Biblically speaking, the distinguishing mark of the people of God is their confession that Jesus is Lord and their belief that God has raised him from the dead. And I'm quite aware that I'm saying these things and it's beginning to sound a little bit exclusive, more exclusive than some of us are comfortable with. But I, I've met a lot of people who, who think that they're part of the church just based on their connection with or involvement in a church. But that's not what the Bible says. If it's true that anybody could walk into this building today, they could be singing, they could be listening to the Word of God, they could pray, they could join a care group. But without confessing Christ, they can do all those things. So then those things don't necessarily mean that you are saved, that you are part of the church. So we need to understand that there's something that has to take place in someone's life. Something has to change. We call it conversion, but I want to look at what this really is to know who it is that's in the church. And most of you might be wondering why I'm belaboring this point, because oftentimes I, I preach this, that we need to be saved, and this is how we are saved. But I think it's important that we understand that there are more people than we probably assume that are not converted, that are in this room right now. And it's also important, as we're going to see, that we shouldn't forget what actually happened at our conversion as we move forward in our Christian lives. So allow me to linger on the glorious gospel that God has used to bring the church into existence. To do this, I want to use chapters 1 and, and 2 in Ephesians. So if you're there, we're going to start in chapter 2. We're going to kind of go back and forth there. This isn't the only place that the Bible speaks of the church, but because there's so much there that I want to refer to, and it's all close together, I think it's a good place for us to start. We're not going to read the whole thing, but its, it's sections are laid out nicely. See, what Paul is doing here is he's writing a letter to the church, the people of God. And what he wants to do is he wants to remind them of what they were before they were saved, what they are now that they're saved, and how it is that God wants to use these believers these converted people in the world. And so I want to start, but just by looking at chapter 2, in the first three verses there, it reminds us of what we were before we were saved. So this isn't just the Ephesian Christian's story. This is our story as well. So listen to what it says. Verse 1 reads, You were dead 
in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul doesn't want, he doesn't leave any room for misinterpretation. What he wants us to know is that dead is dead. Sometimes people will ask the question, well, well how dead were we? <laughs> we were dead. Dead is dead. And so what this means is that we were morally bankrupt before God. We were spiritually dead, and there is nothing that we could do to please God. Paul says, the writer of Ephesians says elsewhere, we know this, no one is righteous, no, not one. And he also says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. And then we see in verse 2, it also says that we were following the course of this world. So that is that we were serving ourselves, living like the rest of mankind, selfishly not submitting to our Creator. And then it says in verse 3, or also in verse 2, that we were following the prince of the power of the air. That is, we were doing the will of Satan, God's enemy, going against God, going with the devil's temptations and submitting to those. So this is what we were before we were saved. And Paul wants the Ephesian Christians, just like I want to do today, is remind us all about how it is or what it is that God has done to bring us into the church. First, we see what we were. And verse 3 kind of summarizes this and says, here's where we were headed. It says that we were, he calls us, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath because of our sin. We were all doomed to, to experience the wrath of God because of it. But now that these are Christians that he's speaking to, he says, like we once were, this, and the rest of mankind remains that way, unless they are saved like these Christians. And so when you, as a Christian, tell your testimony, what, what we need to remember is what's more frightful than the drugs that you may have been addicted to and the language that you used to use, and, and perhaps the laws that you broke and the trouble that you got into, what's more frightful than all of those things was the unending righteous wrath of, of an all-powerful God that was being stored up against you because you refused to submit to Him. That is our testimony. And this isn't explained for us as a group. Paul is referring here to each individual person. It wasn't that we all came to Christ together at once, but each individual person is being saved from their dead in trespasses And so what we see is that we need to know that this is our own lives. This is your story. This is your pastor's story. This is everybody's story who is part of the church. This is where it starts. But then, once we realize this, that before God we are doomed to wrath, that we are utterly guilty of sin, and we are desperately unable to do anything to avoid this wrath, this is where the gospel takes place. And look at verse 4. But God. So although the situation looked as it was, God did something. And not only is the wrath of God something that we are in danger of, that we need to be rescued from, it's also impossible for us to save ourselves from it. But then we have in verse 4 these two words, but God. And this is the beginning of the greatest news ever that any child of wrath could ever hear. God's grace towards sinners is unparalleled here. We saw how bad we were, how doomed we were, and then God comes in. And after describing humanity's hopeless highway to hell, verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. There is more to God than just His righteous and holy wrath. Many times we separate these things, but here He says He's also rich in mercy and the great love with which He loved us. Who? Those who are dead in sin. And so God steps in and He raises dead people back to life. Spiritual life He gives them. And dead people on their own can't do anything. They can't even scratch their nose if they wanted to. And verse 5 continues, so it explains how this took place. By grace, you have been saved. Meaning that it's not because we did anything to deserve it, but because God planned it, God purposed it, and God's power carried it through. So every single one, every single Christian in the world who has ever existed and who will ever exist, was brought into and converted and changed and saved 
by the grace of God. This was God's work. And anyone who truly understands the depth of their sin and the measure of God's wrath and how desperately they are in need of forgiveness, they will will not be shocked so much at the life that someone used to live as much as they would be shocked at the fact that God saved them. And this is every one of ours story. So God is rich in mercy, and He has great love for us, and it caused Him to send His Son into the world to save sinners. And this He did by becoming human in order to suffer and die in the place of these spiritually dead people. And although we can't fully understand it, we're told in the Bible that Jesus took upon Himself our very sins. And He went to endure our very punishment so that we can be forgiven. This is the good news. And the Bible says, for our sake, God made Jesus, He made Him to be sin, even though Jesus knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And God makes this possible not by giving us a list of things to do, not by any other works, but offering it to us as a gift. This is the grace of God. He offers to spiritually dead people who realize this, realize there's nothing they can do, and He offers it to us as a gift to be received by fully believing that this has taken place, that God has done this, by truly trusting that, that, we, uh, that this happened in our place, and by personally relying on on this promise that we would be saved in Christ. And so verse 8 and 9 reiterate to each one of us. If you look at verse 8 and 9, it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so the first point that I want to make is that everyone in the church is saved by Christ. Everyone. And if you're not saved by Christ, by God's grace, through faith in Christ, then you are not part of the church. That's what the Bible is saying. In Ephesians 5, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So inclusion in the church is not so much about what you have done, but by faith what Christ has done for you. Does that make sense? And so every one of us has received the same mercy the same love, the same grace. We all have the same Lord, the same Savior, and the same faith. And every believer is united in Christ because He is their Savior. He is our Savior, the Savior of the church. And and so if you're realizing this today, how, how dead you are without God's mercy, and how doomed you are for God's wrath, and how desperate you are for God's grace. You today can turn away from sin and turn towards God in faith, believing and trusting that Jesus' work on the cross, His death and His resurrection can save you because He did it in your place for your sins and He's made you alive. But that's not all He did. After after making us alive with Christ, go to verse 6. It continues, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ. And what Paul wants us not to miss, he says it over and over, is that Jesus is the nucleus of our salvation. Everything is connected to him. Everything is, as we see, in Christ. If you are a believer, you are made alive in him. You are raised up because of him. You are seated in the heavenly places with Him. It's all about Christ. So we shouldn't just limit our salvation to just forgiveness of sin because that would downplay so much more of what God has done for us. If believers were only forgiven, if that's all we got, we weren't, we weren't made alive spiritually, then we would just be as bad as we were before. We would continue dead in our sins. But it says here that God made us alive spiritually. And He raised us up and He seated us with Christ. And we need to begin to think of ourselves as as having a whole new life. We've been born again to an entirely new way of living. And when you read the Bible, 
especially the New Testament, how we are in Christ, especially Paul, the writer of Ephesians, he uses this language here, he uses it elsewhere. You've probably read it yourself. We can't help but see how tied into or one we have become with Christ. So there's something that happens at your salvation, that it has happened. That when you put your faith in Christ, you're not only forgiven, but there is so much more that has taken place that, that our lives now, all the commands in the New Testament, we are to do in Christ or through Christ. It also says that we have been baptized into Christ. We are completely immersed in Him. And it sounds as if our life has become His and His life has become ours. Just for a moment, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. The first section that Paul is, is beginning with in this letter says the phrase, in Christ, more times than we can even guess. And, and, and what I want you to see is how it is that God has saved you and all that God has done in your salvation, He's done it through Christ. He's done it for us in Christ. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 3. It says that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4 says that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, in Him. Verse 5, God predestined us for adoption as sons in Christ. Verse 6, God has blessed us in the Beloved, referring to Christ. Verse 7, in Christ we have redemption through His blood. Verse 9 and 10 tell us that God's eternal purpose, what He has been doing for all time, was carried out, it says, in Christ and then it says, to unite all things in Him, in Christ. Verse 11, in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 13, in Christ you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So you get, this, you get the sense that Christ is important here. We're not just saved or, or forgiven by Christ. We are completely changed. And everything that God has done for us has happened and come through Christ Himself. We already saw in chapter 2 that there was this explanation of what we were before we were saved. And now what Paul does in chapter 1 there was what we are now that we are saved. And our life is completely changed. It's all wrapped up in who Christ is. We are united with Christ. And Paul believes this is important for every Christian to know. Why? Because everything that God has purposed to do in this world, not just your own life, but in the world, including salvation, including eternal life. All of it is done, as we see, in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, our identification with Him as believers is the mark of those who are in the church. If you're in the church, if you are saved, you are in Christ. And now, this may not be easy to understand because it's, it sounds complicated sometimes, but Paul says elsewhere, he says that because of his union with Christ... He says this, I have been crucified with Christ. But Paul is still alive. He's living his life. He wasn't crucified at this point. How can he say this? Because he's so united to Christ, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. That's how in and united they are. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, so he's still living his life, but he does it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you get this sense that Christ is, or he is in Christ, and Christ is in him? There's something that happens that I can't fully explain or even understand. And yet this is what the Bible teaches us. That every single believer, when they are saved by faith, they're not just forgiven, they are united in Christ. Even in Philippians when Paul is talking about if he continues to live, or however long he continues to live, he says this, to live is Christ. That's how connected he is with Christ. And he also says elsewhere in Colossians, for you, you have died, and that is with Christ, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So this is, this is so important for us to understand, that we're not just forgiven and you're on your way. But you are not just changed, you are transformed by being united to Christ. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, then what? He is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. 
Does this change the way that you think about your salvation? There, there is so much more going on here, and this is what God has purposed to do. And if we understand our conversion this way, what God did in our own lives, we will begin to see what God is doing through the church. It's much more. Our salvation is much more than just a get-out-of-hell-free card and that we can just get forgiveness every time that we sin or continue in sin. But it, it's an entirely new person. We are a new person, one that's united with Christ in a way that when God sees us, he sees Christ. It's amazing. So the, the second thing that we need to see here is that everyone in the church is united with Christ. So we are saved by Christ, and we are united with Christ. So again, if you're not united with Christ, then you are not a part of the church. Because those two things happen at the same time. And so if you're here today and you're realizing that there is a lot of change that needs to happen in our lives for God to accept us, and that our attempts are so feeble to make changes, to stop sinning, they just don't last, they don't work. And, and you realize how extensive the change that God requires really is, and you also realize how complete Christ will change you by faith in Him, then, then, then abandon your futile attempts to try and please God on your own. We need to give those up. And what he's offering to us as a free gift is embracing Jesus' offer to work in and through us by his Holy Spirit. Again, we see that the church is made up of people who didn't earn their spot. They don't, they don't get their way in by either desiring it or doing certain things. But by faith, they are saved. And by faith, they are united to Christ. Now let's go back to what I said before as we were looking at what the church is or who the church is, now that we've seen this idea of conversion, we can understand the church better. First of all, we know that the church is a people, the people of God. Second, we know that the people of God are those who are saved by grace through faith in Christ, through what He has done for us. Thirdly, that when we're saved, the people of God are transformed as they are united to Christ. Almost to say that your life now is Christ. And because they're all in Christ, you are in Christ, and you are in Christ, and I am in Christ, because we're in the same one, we are necessarily inseparable with one another, because we're all in Christ together. What this means is that God's purpose for every single individual believer is to join them together to begin living out now the purpose for which he created humans in the first place. And when we do this, we as the people of God together, we begin to demonstrate who God is to the world and his glory and his greatness and, and, and his character and the gospel itself. And this is what God wants to do by it, saving individuals and putting them together to live in unity with one another. And so after he's detailed each individual's conversion in Ephesians 1 and 2, at the end of, of chapter 2, which we'll go to next, he begins to pronounce the implications of this. So he talks to the individual, and now he says that since all believers are united to Christ, that means that every believer is united to each other. And this is how the church begins to, to form. No matter how different we may be from the person sitting next to us, no matter how different... No matter what those differences are, if you are in Christ, you are one. You are united together. Look at verse 19 in chapter 2. It says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There's equality there. There's, there's unity there. It doesn't matter how physically or socially or economically or ethnically different two believers may be, but if they are in Christ, they are equal when it comes to salvation. They are equally in Christ, and Christ is equally in them. Galatians 3 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, so let's say that that's another way of saying you were converted, you were in Christ. It says, As many of you have, who have done that, have put on Christ. So you all have Christ on. And then he says this, that because that has happened in your life, the next verse says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So the church 
we see it is a new people that God is putting together. And they're not distinguished by what the world distinguishes people by. It's not by race. It's not by gender. It's not by wealth. It's not by their job or their abilities or their beauty or their popularity or their knowledge or their strength. That's how the world distinguishes between people. But the difference between that and the people of God is that they are united and equal in Christ. That's what brings them together. And so again, it's not our doing. It is God's doing in us. And not only in our lives individually, but he's bringing together a brand new people in this world to live in a way that testifies to the fact that there is a divine transforming power within us. That the church is not run just by human people doing what they think is best, but God is doing something here in us and all the church around the globe and throughout history that we couldn't stop if we wanted to. The converted community of Christians in the world are, as verse 19 called us, fellow citizens, there's equality there, with the saints, and we are equally members of the household of God. Now look at verse 20. It says that every single one of us is built on the same foundation, and that the cornerstone, that is the thing that holds everything together, the cornerstone is Christ Jesus. And it says, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is what God is doing. He's putting us together. And so we can't think that the plan of God can do without the church. You see how in, important it is? If you look at verse 22, this is what it means. In Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. <laughs> it's amazing. We don't even fully understand this and see this. But this is what God is doing in His church. And so if we are to fulfill the intention that God has for the church, then it's necessary for Christians to live interconnected lives with other believers. This is important for us to see. And the word unity, as I've titled this sermon, One in Christ, there is a unity because we're all in Christ. Doesn't that just summarize all these New Testament commands to love one another, be kind to one another, be at peace with one another, forgive one another? This is what the people of God do, and they are unified in Christ, not because of anything else, among such a diverse people, even in this room, let alone the world. God is uniting people, stopping them from, from, from distinctions, distinctions and distinguishing between people based on other things, but uniting them because of one thing, and that is Christ. And when we live together, when we live in obedience to Christ, in the power of Christ, for the glory of Christ as individuals, when we do this together as the church, amazingly, we begin to do, at Strathmore Alliance in 2019, we will do what Ephesians 3, verses 9 and 10 calls the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. And that is that through the church, the people of God, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This is so much bigger than anything that we could do on our own. This is what God is doing in his church. So church, let that sink in. The third point I want to make is that everyone in the church is joined in Christ. So again, if you're not joined in Christ to other believers, then you are not a part of the church. And what I'm saying is that when someone trusts, relies on, banks on Christ alone for their salvation from sin, but also to be made alive and transformed completely, when somebody does that, they are not only saved from their sins, they are united with Christ and they are joined together with all other believers in Christ. And so today, if you are realizing how inseparable we are to live our lives with other Christians, how interconnected we are to be with other Christians, and how unified we must seek to be with other Christians, then we need to trust that God's Word is teaching us this truth for a reason, to help us understand our purpose, and also that we need to take the steps in faith to be joined together as God has designed us to be. So with that, we are one in Christ. And here's what I think that, at least one thing that we need to take away from this beginning as we look at the church and, and what this means, how we're all connected together. And I think it's this. 
that when we define the church by what happens in one building for one hour in, on one day of the week, when we confine church to just that and those people, then we actually are minimizing the purpose of God and we are diminishing the glory of God. But when we get a glimpse of what God is doing, the astounding reality that God is doing in you and in me and in us together, when we see that, and it's not just here, it's around the globe and it's throughout all of history, the church is more than just us, and when we see what that is, it should open our eyes to such a bigger purpose and to put into perspective how unity in each local church is important, is so important. Brothers and sisters, the church is not an optional accessory for us to join, to leave, to come, to go as we please, as it works for us or as we want. It is a necessary instrument that God has ordained, no matter how imperfect it may be, He is using it in His eternal plan. And if each one of us would be committed to fulfilling what God has designed for us individually and to do that together, We'll stop trying to use the church to serve our own individual preferences or purposes, which it was never intended to do. And we'll start to strive for the unity of the people of God, the good of the people of God, specifically in the local church we find ourselves in. And in this way, the people of God in Strathmore Alliance and other churches who are doing the very same thing will be joined together with Christ as our head and we as his body, which Ephesians 1, 23 says, is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace and your power to change our lives. When we know for ourselves, that we are dead in our sins. And we see that there is no escape from your wrath. And yet we know that there is a God who is more than just wrath and anger, but grace and mercy and kindness. We see the gospel. And we thank you for what you have done in in some people's lives here. And we pray that it would continue to happen in other people's lives who turn to you in faith, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God the one in whom we find forgiveness of sins and so much more. And I pray that all of us who have experienced this salvation already, who have been changed, transformed, and united with Christ, that we would also recognize that being in Christ means that we are one with one another and that our lives are not just our own, but they are yours and you are purposing to bring a new people, building your kingdom in a way that that witnesses to the world and compels them to see not just a a different way of life, but who you are truly as our God. I thank you that you have shown so many people grace, and I pray that it would continue to happen, that Christ would be seen as their Savior, as the Lord that they need to submit their lives to. And we pray that this would be something that we don't forget, but continually remember that this is how we became part of your church, and this is how it is that you will continue to work in your church. I pray that we here at Strathmore Alliance today and moving forward in this understanding would be strengthened to be more united, that you would help us to be united and that we would seek the unity of this church among such diversity that we would be united in Christ. And we can only do that by your spirit. So we ask you in Jesus' name, amen.